My name is Simon Chaplin, the Director of Wellcome Collection and Director of Culture and Society at the Wellcome Trust. This is the Doctor as Collector, the 2018 Pointer Lecture for the British Society for the History of Medicine. I didn't know Frederick Pointer, but in some ways I'm the heir to his creation. Born in 1908, Pointer's connection with Wellcome began in 1930, when he became an assistant librarian in the Wellcome Museum and Historical Medical Library. Apart from a brief period of service in the RAF, Pointer remained connected with Wellcome for the rest of his career. He became Chief Librarian in 1954 and Director of the Wellcome Museum and Library in 1964, overseeing its transition into the Wellcome Institute, which for over three decades was regarded as one of, if not the, preeminent centres of thought leadership in the history of medicine. As well as his professional role at Wellcome, Pointer was also active in the Society of Apothecaries, leading the establishment of its Faculty for the History and Philosophy of Medicine, and was also active in many national and international societies, the BSHM among them. And he maintained an active research career, publishing not only on the contents of the Wellcome Library, but more widely on the practice of medicine in the 16th and 17th centuries. Reflecting on his life from my perspective as a former head of the Wellcome Library and more recently as Wellcome's Director of Culture and Society and Director of Wellcome Collection, I'm struck by a number of things. The first is that Wellcome has been and remains a dynamic and changing organisation. Pointer's career involved the building up and winding down of the Wellcome Medical Historical Museum, the waxing of the Medical Library and its transition into the Wellcome Institute. He oversaw the dispersal of huge parts of Henry Wellcome's collection while adding many more in other areas. Throughout it, he remained true not to a static model of Wellcome's legacy, but one that responded and evolved by keeping at its heart a concern that health, that fundamental part of our human experience, and medicine, the set of practices through which we seek to preserve and restore health, should be seen as a part of human culture and society, past, present and future. This remains true today as we move back again to seeing Wellcome Collection as an integrated museum and library which seeks to challenge how we think and feel about health. And it won't surprise you to know there's a connection between this shared history and my talk today. I remember the first time I visited the Wellcome Library. I was working as a, an assistant curator at the Science Museum in London and I was sent to help install a set of large pharmacy jars on the bookcases in the pointer room. I was under the careful direction of one of my predecessors, who shall remain nameless, but who was to me as the Victorian chimney sweep was to his boys, providing encouragement and advice as I climbed a wobbly set of library steps with a giant pharmacy jar in my hands. This was before the invention of risk assessments, I think. And it was that the pointer room should be so adorned, for pointer's interest in 17th century medicine coincides with a turning point in the history of museums and libraries. The coming together of the austere monastic model of the library with its ranks of chained or cased books, with the eclecticism of the princely cabinet or Wunderkammer. Originating in the Renaissance, as seen here in the cabinet of Ferranti Imperato, as depicted in his Delistoria Naturale of 1599, by the end of the 18th century, Europe was blessed with beautiful, multifaceted temples to knowledge, such as the Clementinum Library in Prague. Now, unlike Pointer, my expertise lies in the 18th rather than the 17th century, so in what follows I'm going to be talking as doctors, as collectors, with a focus on London and the period 1750 to 1800. But I'm going to explore this idea of libraries and museums as public spaces of showing, as well as repositories of private knowledge. I'm going to talk about collections of plants, animals, curiosities, works of art, books and body parts of patients and their stories. I'm particularly interested in how these collections were stored and shown to others and how through this culture of collecting and display a new kind of medical identity and medical authority was constructed at a critical juncture in the history of the Western medical tradition. This idea grows out of my interest in the work of the 18th century surgeon and anatomist John Hunter, whose museum was not only important as a resource for teaching and research, but also as a means of showing his work to a wider public audience in Georgian London.
its significance as a means of promulgating a positive professional identity was one of the reasons why it became and remains a significant element of London's College of Surgeons. I've coined the phrase the museum economy to describe the way in which John Hunter's museum worked and the way in which many other anatomist museums worked in London at the same time. It draws together four connected notions of the moral economy, the way in which museums presented anatomists as men of virtuous character, of the political economy as a way of showing the value of their work, of the domestic economy, showing how museums were integral to the places where anatomists lived as well as where they worked, and of course of the, na the natural or animal economy, that museums were a way of revealing knowledge of the natural world. The importance of the museum economy as it applied in particular to the hunters and to other anatomists was the way in which it helped manage the very tensions associated with the practice of dissection in the 18th century, not least, of course, the supply of bodies to anatomists. And it was the role of the museum as a kind of space linking the noisome private environment of the dissecting room with the polite public space of the drawing room that made anatomical museums such a potent form. Now what I'm going to do today is to talk about this idea of the museum as a connecting space, a space of revelation, and extend that to a whole range of other kinds of collecting practice. To talk about public and semi-public displays, gardens, menageries and libraries, giving some examples of each. And rather than just look at this in the context of dissection and anatomists, I'm going to suggest that there are more diverse models that nevertheless reveal the way in which a particular kind of clinical medical authority was constructed. And in doing this, I'm reflecting that one doesn't have to confine this approach just to looking at anatomists or indeed just to looking at doctors. So we might take, for example, the case of Joseph Banks, the naturalist who accompanied Captain Cook's first voyage and who became the dominant figure in London's scientific community in the late 18th and early 19th century. Banks had an extensive collection of natural and artificial curiosities, many of which were assembled through the voyages of Captain Cook and others. In his house in Burlington Street, uh, a he had a museum which was described as being full to the brim, a disorderly space full of all kinds of cluttered curiosities. However, after he moved to a new house in Soho Square in 1777, Banks's museum took on a much more structured and form. We can see the facade of his house here, but also on the left a plan which shows the layout of the space. And what's important here is the idea of the museum as a social space as well as a professional space, a space in which he could both contain the products of research, but also expose those products to a wider audience. This interior view of Joseph Banks' Herbarium and Library at Soho Square gives some sense of this orderly appearance. And you can see the bookshelves, but also displayed upon them objects, busts and other antiquities. What's important about this then is it reflects the kind of knowledge, botanical knowledge in particular, that Banks was interested in, but does so in a way that hides the actual work of botanizing, which for the most part was being done by others. So Banks at the rear of his house had workshops where his assistants would be preparing specimens for his herbaria. As they moved, however, into the herbaria, it became more ordered, more visual objects, things which could be stored and displayed in purpose-built cabinets laid out in very specific ways on herbarium sheets. It was true for his collections, for example, of insects, again, seeing them laid out here in neat rows. This is nature ordered, while the work, the messy work that goes into creating this order is hidden from view. So I'm interested in this idea of the collection as a whole and the way in which it reveals knowledge as an ordered manifestation of the whole while concealing the messy work that goes into it. But also within this, there is 
alongside it the idea of individual objects as particularly potent signifiers, things which allowed stories to be told. And we might reflect here on the work of people like Chris Plum, for example, who works on 18th century menageries, Claire Hickman, who's looked at gard gardens, both of whom have shared an interest in the way in which they're these spaces, but their specific contents excited sensation and sympathy, for example. Ludmilla Jordanova, among others, has written and spoken on this, especially in relation to portraiture. And I don't want to dwell on their work, but there is a common theme and to their work and to mine and to other historians of 18th century material and visual culture, which is the extent to which contemporary visitors were able to recognise and comprehend the stories behind objects their provenance, their allegorical as well as their natural significance, their emotional connotations. By way of illustration, let's take this portrait of John Heaviside. This is a coloured mezzotint after an original portrait by Johann Zoffany, which no longer survives, showing the surgeon and anatomist John Heaviside, a fairly nondescript surgeon active in London in the late 18th century, a former student of John Hunter. Heaviside comes to greater prominence because in 1793 he acquires the anatomical museum of another more significant surgeon and teacher of anatomy, Henry Watson. It's telling that while we have no portrait of Watson, we do have one of Heaviside. Why? Because he took Watson's museum and the anatomical specimens or preparations it contained, and he used it to forge his own professional identity. Heaviside, shown here, was open to the public. Like all good museums, he recognised the value of refreshments, he gave his visitors tea, coffee and buttered rolls. There's no record of whether he had a gift shop, but he clearly had an instinct for not just display, but for storytelling. And the stories he was telling were often about other people's work that he had appropriated. Let's go back right. And you'll see that alongside Heaviside, there are two body parts on show with him. In the background, uh, we have a glass jar containing a section of human spine. It shows a uh, distortion resulting from tuberculosis, a condition first described by Heaviside's mentor, the surgeon Percival Pott, which still bears Pott's name, Pott's disease. I haven't been able to ascertain whether this is an original Pott specimen. It differs from those which Pott used in his illustrations, but it nevertheless demonstrates Heaviside's acknowledgement of a surgical heritage, that of Percival Pot. The specimen he's holding in his left hand and addressing with his right hand is even more significant. This is a specimen of a dried human heart and you can see an engraved illustration of that on the right hand slide, side of the slide. In fact we know whose heart it is. It's the heart of Philip Kendall a Chandler from Soho, who died at the Westminster Infirmary in 1783, and whose case was described and published by Henry Watson and by his colleague, the physician Samuel Fort Simmons. Now, its inclusion in Heaviside's portrait was probably prompted by its inclusion in a contemporary textbook, Matthew Bailey's Morbid Anatomy, one of the first textbooks of what we'd now regard as pathology. And it's a very graphic illustration of Heaviside laying claim to somebody else's work and demonstrating his authority through his ownership of this authoritative specimen, this specimen which has become an emblem of the new science of pathology. So we might imagine then that through his museum containing many thousands of these specimens, Heaviside is doing this on a grand scale, but part of that effect relies not just on the visual appearance of the whole, but also the affect that came from particular items contained within it. So with this in mind, how might the collecting and display of different kinds of material help doctors position themselves differently in the eyes of their peers and a wider public audience? We might take this portrait of William Hunter by Robert Edge Pine from the early 1760s as a good starting point. It's a very interesting portrait. Um, it shows William Hunter, another anatomist and surgeon, 
the elder brother to John Hunter, a man who'd made his reputation as one of the first teachers of anatomy in London in the mid part of the 18th century, clearly reflecting his work as an anatomist in the covered specimen under a glass bell jar at the rear of the portrait. But interestingly, Hunter's posture turned away from the specimen perhaps suggests his own move away from hands-on anatomy towards a more genteel status as a gentleman physician. And over the course of his career, William Hunter was to give up his membership of the College of Surgeons, to become a licentiate of the College of Physicians, and he was an adept social climber. In fact, the historian Roy Porter has talked about William Hunter and his museum as a way of buying into genteel status by collecting a range of objects, not simply anatomical, but covering fine and decorative arts, manuscripts, books, coins, medals, in order to demonstrate his expertise, not just as a medical man, but as a connoisseur and a virtuoso. This is the facade of uh, William Hunter's house, which was also the private anatomy school that he ran in Great Windmill Street, so a combined house come anatomy school. And in the plan of the house on the left-hand side of this slide, again, you can see this ordered hierarchy at the front, the living quarters, at the back, the dissecting rooms and anatomical theatre, and in between them, his library and museum, acting as a kind of separating space, a liminal space, a place in which the objects of anatomical study might be brought out and visitors might be brought in, but which nevertheless separates the polite visitor from the dissecting room. We don't have an interior view of William Hunter's museum, but this uh, much later view of the Hunterian Museum in its later incarnation at the, uh, muse at the University of Glasgow, where it still resides, gives some idea of its heterogeneity, the range of objects contained within it. Another contemporary collector who could be described as buying into respectability through his collecting is Richard Mead. And here's Mead in a portrait by Alan Ramsey from 1740. A portrait which is itself a statement of Mead's character as a man of taste and judgment, both in the choice of Ramsey as an artist and in the objects depicted with him, notably the so-called Arundel head, a Hellenistic bronze bust from the second century BC, which was at the time one of the most famous and prized classical antiquities in Britain. It's now in the British Museum. Mead's collection of paintings, sculpture, coins and medals, other antiquities and a library of over 10,000 books was housed in a purpose-built gallery behind his house in Great Ormond Street and was an important space for Mead's frequent entertaining, as well as being made available to scholars and artists. Mead was a generous philanthropist, a key figure in the founding of the Foundling Hospital. He wasn't, however, without controversy. Horace Walpole described Mead as very voluptuous, expending huge sums to ensure the discretion of his amorous affairs. And in his professional life too, Mead courted controversy as an early proponent of inoculation against smallpox, which became a routine procedure on the orphans in the Foundling Hospital. Mead's name is now less familiar than that of his near contemporary Hans Sloan, although Stephanie Chapman's excellent exhibition about Mead at the Foundling Museum a couple of years ago has helped redress this somewhat. We know Sloan's name because of his association with the Chelsea Physic Garden, the future of which he guaranteed in 1712 when he purchased the freehold and provided it on a peppercorn lease to the Society of Apothecaries, but also because his library and museum provided the founding collection for the British Museum. As a collector of natural history and other curiosities from his youth, Sloan made his name with his natural history of Jamaica, the product of a 15 month stint in the West Indies in 1686, 1687, which also yielded a wife and a significant slave plantation in Jamaica, which helped fund his collecting. In 1701, he purchased the cabinet of a merchant called William Corton, significantly expanding his collection. And over the course of his life, Sloan's museum was bolstered by the wholesale acquisition of several other cabinets or collections, 
he ended up amassing over 70,000 objects by his death in 1753. Up until 1742, Sloane lived at Bloomsbury Place in central London, uh, where his collections eventually came to occupy 11 rooms spread over two adjoining houses. After he retired from practice in 1742, Sloane took the opportunity to move his collections from Bloomsbury Place to a Tudor manor house in Chelsea, where the large formal rooms, including a long gallery, 110 feet in length, provided an ideal space for displaying his collections. Like Mead, Sloane was also well known for granting ready access to his collection, so that by the time of his death, the Gentleman's Magazine was able to describe it as one of the most magnificent private, if not public, collections upon earth, the use or inspection of which he never refused to anyone. But it's interesting that Sloane's collection didn't always reflect well on him. In the early 1700s, Sloane's apparently indiscriminate taste led his collection to be labelled as the typical project, product of virtuosic excess by some contemporary critics. And before his move to Chelsea in 1742, when the collection was still overflowing its space in Bloomsbury Place, some critics used the apparent disorder of the house, with its every closet and chimney packed with books and rarities, etc., to criticise Sloane for being intellectually ill-disciplined. Perhaps uh, prompted by these jibes, Sloane later became a punctilious compiler or commissioner of catalogues, and his collection was later organised into discrete sections according to object type. So what's important here is that having a collection itself was not sufficient to engender respect. And in fact, having a disordered collection could have quite the opposite effect. And we might see this in this early 18th century scene of a physician examining a urine flask by Gerard Thomas. And what's interesting here is the way in which the physician is surrounded by the objects of learning, but which are presented in a disordered state, undermining his ability to project uh, an impression of control and authority. So this sense that disordered collecting could reflect a disordered mind which could undermine any claim to genteel status and particularly could undermine any claim to medical authority. We see the same thing in London in the 18th century, for example, in the case of John Fothergill. Fothergill was born in Yorkshire, very famous Quaker physician, and also a prolific collector. One of his contemporaries, John Eliot, described Fothergill's house as the perfect museum. A patient no sooner has the street door open to him than he is struck with the appearance of mosses, shells, dried foreign animals and the like. He is led immediately to conclude the doctor, like Solomon, is a very deep man as indeed he is in one sense of the word. Deep is here signifying Fothergill's depth of pocket, his ability to spend, manifested in his purchase of objects to convey what Eliot considered to be a very shallow impression of learning. So the fact that Fothergill could buy collections didn't mean he could buy authority or prestige. Now, in 1762, Fothergill purchased Upton House in Essex. He added to its grounds the purchase of adjoining land, and he created one of the largest private gardens in Europe. As well as conventional landscape gardens, it included an arboretum and a suite of hothouses and glasshouses over 260 feet long, with over 3,000 species of exotic plants. Fothergill was particularly interested in species of medical or economic value, and he became the hub of a network of international exchange, for example, receiving bamboos and tea from China and sending them to the Americas, and almost succeeded in cultivating the cinchona tree from South America, one of the most valuable sources of Materia Medica then known. Fothergill also possessed extensive collections of shells, second only, it was said, to the Duchess of Portland, ores and minerals, preserved reptiles and other animals, a most elegant cabinet of insects, in the words of one contemporary, and a collection of corals that was the foremost in Europe. 
Much of Fothergill's collection of natural history, together with other pieces, was purchased by William Hunter after Fothergill's death. He also had a large collection of prints and drawings, including many showing natural history subjects, which ended up in the Kunstkamera of Catherine the Great in Russia. Now, Interestingly, if this illustration is to be believed, Father Gill also had some live exotic animals in his collection. It looks like a scarlet ibis in the foreground there, a native of the Caribbean, rather than a more familiar Essex bird. Like uh, Sloan, uh, Father Gill was also interested in the cataloguing and ordering of his collection. His collection of plants was catalogued by John Coakley Letsom, of whom we're going to hear a bit more in a moment. The catalogue that was prepared included instructions on how to collect and how to organise collections. So with great focus on ordered display, as well as the practice of accumulation. And in fact, it was John Coakley Letsom who was to develop the work of Fothergill through his own collecting and display. This is Coakley Letsom's The Naturalist and Traveller's Companion, containing instructions for collecting and preserving objects of natural history, which includes detailed technical instructions about how, for example, preserved insects are to be shown. And here we can see John Coakley Letsom with his family at his country estate at Grove Hill in Camberwell, painted around 1786. Born in the West Indies, Letson was sent to England to be educated and came to the attention of Fothergill, uh, Samuel Fothergill, a Quaker preacher who was John Fothergill's brother. Having enthused him with an interest in botany as well as medicine, Samuel sent Letson to London to complete his medical studies. And he became a close friend of John Fothergill and inherited many of his plants as well as some of his greenhouses after his death. And Letson had a distinguished medical career. He was a founder of the Medical Society of London, of the Aldersgate Dispensary, and one of the founding members of the Humane Society. But he was perhaps best known for his villa and gardens in Camberwell, Grove Hill, modelled in part on uh, Upton. He took a lease on Grove Hill in 1779, and like Fothergill, he developed and expanded his estate, again building greenhouses, a library and museum, to pleasure gardens, which we can see here, a little boating lake and a folly in the middle. And he was described as, um, his estate was described by one of his contemporaries, uh, the Frenchman uh, Barthemy Fogas Informe, as um, containing the choicest vegetables, a menagerie, and perhaps uh, appealing to Fogas Informe's tastes, the most lovely women in London. So clearly a space of very unusual social encounters as well as encounters with objects of natural history. We can see a view of the house from the side which shows the different modifications. This is, shows it in about 1781. There were many more modifications afterwards, including the classical decorations. You can see some codestone plaques along the front of the house survive on a building nearby uh, in Camberwell today. Codestone tablets showing liberality, plenty and flora, again suggesting uh, a fondness for acquisition and proliferation, particularly of natural objects. What's striking about Grove Hill is again the importance attached to order in all of this display. It was described by the European magazine as being a model of neatness and simplicity. And if we look at a plan of the estate, we can see this in the way in which different spaces feed into one another. For example, here in this slide, the uh, hothouses and greenhouses shown as C with the museum, which then feeds into the library and into the dwelling house. So rather like the arrangement of William Hunter's Anatomy School, a kind of series of transitional spaces. One enters the house, into the library, the museum, the greenhouses, out into the gardens, where there's a mixture of formal gardens, a pharmacy garden, but also succession gardens, gardens which are used for kind of planting out and creating the work that goes into the display in the formal areas. And we get some sense of the range of materials
from the sale catalogue of Letsom's museum, which includes a wide range of objects, coins, medals, uh, anatomical specimens, mummies, um, British and foreign antiquities, as well as contemporary curiosities. And it's perhaps using Letsom's model that we might then look at the house of John Hunter and his museum. This is John Hunter, painted in 1788 by Joshua Reynolds, again in a portrait which shows his comfort with many of the anatomical objects in his collection. You can see specimen jars and a pair of large feet, which are the feet of Charles Byrne, the Irish giant, whose skeleton was acquired by John Hunter in slightly dubious circumstances a few years before this portrait was painted. So here's John Hunter as an anatomist, as a surgeon, at ease with his collection. And this portrait was engraved and widely reproduced. So it was one that was seen very widely in late 18th century society. John Hunter lived uh, with his wife, uh, Anne Hume Hunter, a poet, uh, in their house on Leicester Square. He also had a country estate at Earl's Court. His house at, uh, in Leicester Square, however, contained his museum. And we can see in this slide a contemporary reconstruction of what this looked like. The house on Leicester Square on the left hand side of the slide, on the far right hand side of the slide, the second house which was backing onto Castle Street, now Charing Cross Road, and in between them the building which contained the museum. The museum was open to John Hunter's students who lived and dissected in the room at the back, in the house at the back, but was also open to the kinds of visitors who came to Anne Hunter's literary salons. And it was described by a contemporary writer as being a very curious, extensive and valuable museum, open for the inspection of a considerable number of the literati, containing a novel and curious system of natural philosophy, which is a very accurate and industrious collection of nearly 30 years. And what strikes us about the description of John Hunter's museum is the way in which it's described as the product of virtuous labour. That labour is, of course, for the most part, the dissection of human and animal bodies, work which was not normally carried out in polite society or under the polite gaze in 18th century London, but whose products could nevertheless be displayed in ways that reinforced rather than diminished the reputation of their creator. John Hunter had a second property then at Earl's Court, a bit like uh, Grove Hill or Upton Park, a country estate, a large house with extensive gardens around it. And again, this was also a space for John Hunter to display his collections and to display his authority over nature. Uh, in the 19th century, as the estate was being cleared, the naturalist Frank Buckland made a kind of voyage of discovery and found within Hunter's old estate traces of his work. Frank Buckland wrote, in a pathway near the house I observed a tree bearing very peculiar incision marks upon the bark. And we can see specimens in the Hunterian Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons, which contain examples of ringing experiments on trees. So the whole of John Hunter's garden became a kind of living laboratory in which he could carry out his work, but in which the results of his experimental researches were also, by definition, on display. And Claire Hitman's written about this idea of the, the garden as a, a laboratory in the 18th century. It was very much that for John Hunter. It was also a space for encounter with living animals. Uh, we have from Jesse Foote both this um, slightly satirical view of John Hunter's house and also a rather acerbic commentary. Uh, Jesse Foote was a, one of John Hunter's arch enemies, so his words need to be regarded with that in mind. But Jesse Foote wrote of Hunter's house, um, it contains a variety of birds and beasts, uh, a matter of great entertainment. You're surprised to find so many living animals in one herd from the most opposite parts of the globe. And for Jesse Foote, who in the background of this picture shows what looks to be a two-headed uh, llama, there's a suggestion this is also a space in which John Hunter is carrying out bizarre and esoteric experiments. <laughs>
but his estate was written about with more uh, complementary words by others. It was regarded as a uh, space for uh, research and for display in ways, again, that reinforced John Hunter's um, reputation. This is the frontispiece from Jesse Foote's extra illustrated Life of John Hunter which shows a range of some of the animal experiments uh, he carried out, work on whales, on the hybridization of wolves and dogs, um, on free martins, on geese, artificial respiration, the transplantation of teeth, and rather unkindly, Jesse Foote has painted John Hunter blowing his own trumpet at the top of the, uh, the scene. But we have a description from Faulkner's History of Kensington in 1820, which I think gives a, a perhaps more uh, complementary view. And Faulkner writes, In this retreat, John Hunter had collected many kinds of animals and birds, and it was to him a favourite amusement in his walks to attend to their actions and to their habits and to make them familiar with him. The refinement of taste and the pursuit of that knowledge which contributes most to raise our admiration and gratitude to a first cause could not be more strongly attended to than in this delightful retreat. So for Faulkner, John Hunter's estate becomes a place for revealing the wonder of nature in, a, in an ordered fashion that reflects the authority of its owner. Uh, his estate included uh, these dens, former ice houses, we think, which were converted to, the, um, uh, uh, to be used as um, places for keeping wild animals. Again, here's a, another unkind illustration by Jesse Foote showing John Hunter with his zebus on the way back from town, uh, meeting another traveller uh, with his camel and monkey. And in fact, Jesse Foote wrote about it, uh, about John Hunter's house. By observing the back of the house, a lawn was found stocked with fowls and animals of the strangest selection in nature, as if it had been another repository belonging to Brooks. And the Brooks he meant was Joshua Brooks, a famous bird merchant and animal dealer who had his uh, premises in near Gray's Inn's Gate in Holborn. This is uh, his business card. Um, Brooks was an animal dealer. He had a son also called Joshua Brooks who became an anatomist. Um, Brooks sold uh, John Hunter a number of, of different animals for his collection. Among them were um, some birds, including an eagle, which he sold to John Hunter just before John Hunter's death, and his wife then was forced to try and get a refund on, on them after he'd passed away. In this portrait, we have an unknown artist showing John Hunter's house. Um, there's an interesting scene on the right-hand side. You can see a pile of rocks with a bird perched upon them, another similar pile on the left-hand side, two animals, what looked like to a lion, and a wolf perhaps standing on the roof of the house either side. I think this is a, uh, an imagined scene, but that those rock piles, those living menageries become important symbols. They become a kind of public display space, the equivalent outdoor space that correlates with the museum or the library indoors as places upon which animals can be shown. And that becomes important when we turn to our next character, this man, Joshua Brooks, the son of Joshua Brooks, the animal dealer, uh, a fellow anatomist, uh, very famous for his battles with the College of Surgeons and with hospital lecturers over the right to teach anatomy, a skilled naturalist, a fellow of the Royal Society and a fellow also of the Linnaean and Zoological Societies. Like John Hunter, he built up an extensive collection. Again, in his portrait by Thomas Phillips, we can see him perhaps consciously echoing the Reynolds portrait of John Hunter, again at ease, surrounded by a mixture of anatomical and natural history objects, as well as his own written work. And we know from the catalogue of his museum, which was sold at auction uh, after his death, how extensive the collection was. Uh, the frontispiece for the sale catalogue in 1828 describes it as uh, the almost endless assemblage of every species of anatomical, pathological, obstetrical and zootomical preparations, as well as subjects in natural history. We don't have an interior view of Joshua Brooks's museum, but we have this exterior view which shows the museum building 
uh, on Great Marlborough Street. What you can't see to the right-hand side is the house in which Joshua Brooks actually lived. Both of those two buildings formerly owned by the natural philosopher Henry Cavendish. And again, if one was to look at a plan of the site, one would see the same linear array of living house, courtyard, museum and dissecting rooms at the back. Now, although he was widely lauded for his anatomical knowledge, he was also noted by his pupils to be a disordered man. One of them wrote, whether from his close abiding in the dissecting room or from his inherent love of dirt, Joshua Brooks was without exception the dirtiest professional person I have ever met. I really know no dirty thing with which he could compare. All and every part of him was dirt. So again, interestingly, what we have with Joshua Brooks is a sense of a man who was not quite able to use his museum, his collection, to shake off this accusation of disorder, that the jumble of the museum carried through into the dirt of his appearance to convey the sense of a disordered mind. We must bear in mind, however, that that writer may also have been one of his critics, one of his opponents in the College of Surgeons. Now, if you look at the uh, picture of the house, you can see in that wall between the two buildings a kind of triangular uh, protrusion over the top in a dark grey. In fact, that's the top of this. And if you remind ourselves of the portrait of John Hunter's house at Earl's Court, you can see here the same kind of outdoor rockery, outdoor menagerie, with a variety of wild birds and animals, in some cases chained to it or living upon it and a, a pair of spectators admiring it. And Joshua Brooks's museum and this outdoor vivarium were again open to the public for people to look around. So much so that he had to issue admission tickets to it to avoid being overrun by visitors and got to the stage where he could afford to charge admission, a shilling per person. So what we see in the story of Letsam and Fothergill, of Mead and Sloane, of Hunter and Brooks, is this constant re-emergence of the theme of collecting and display, not just of anatomical objects, but a whole range of objects, which in different ways reflect back onto the identities of their collectors, and particularly the medical identities of their collectors. And a, a recurrent theme is that when ordered, when neat, these collections reflect positively, when disordered, they reflect negatively. And the ambition, therefore, one might assume, is to build collections which do reflect this order and structure, and in doing so, become positive attributes of the, of the doctor as collector. And in this kind of scamper across the landscape of medical collecting, there's always been that risk of flirting with the same peril of uh, drawing disorder um, from the story. But by trying to draw attention to these common threads that link museums and libraries, menageries and gardens, the kingdoms of nature and those of the living and dead, my aim has been to show that there was purpose to this collecting. By collecting and displaying to others, doctors could demonstrate their taste, their knowledge and their authority, and in particular their authority over nature, animate and inanimate. And order is critical in this. As Lucia de Comey has described, the English philosopher and physician John Locke, who died in 1704, had really been the progenitor of this idea of order. In fact, had developed his own mechanism for creating commonplace books, collections of notes and excerpts in a structured manner. And Lucia de Comey writes, in 18th century Britain, order was a ubiquitous notion that served a moral and social as well as a practical agenda. It was presented in natural displays, it was pursued in accountants' meticulous records, it pointed to the perfection of the divine design in nature and catered to the parameters of taste. Emma Sperry's drawn attention to the significance of this agenda in the pursuits of 18th century natural historians who made the transition from the natural, the brute, to the social, members of polite society, by recapitulating the adamitic process of generating order from an initial perceptual chaos. <laughs> 
and for my collection of 18th century doctors, demonstrating control over and order of collections, whatever their nature, was a demonstration of authority. And all spoke to a wider shared agenda, that of demonstrating authority over another category of object, the bodies of patients. From the 18th century, that we see the origin of a very important shift in medicine, a shift from a focus on individual patients and their case histories to the body of the patient and the marks of disease it contains, from a model of medicine which is inherently individualistic to one which embraces ideas of classification, of diagnosis, and in particular of the ability of the doctor to determine the nature, the cause, and the progress of disease, rather than the individual patient. And we can see this in a table of papers published in medical journals in Britain in the late 18th century. And what's interesting here is looking at the number of papers published in a whole range of different journals, looking at the number of those papers that contain case histories, the second column, which shows that about 81% of the papers were case history based. Of those, about 187 contain cases where patients died, and in 159 of those, records of a post-mortem, of a body being opened. And of course, it's the body being opened, the dissection of a dead body, the process of morbid anatomy, later pathology, that becomes critical to the emergence of clinical medicine in the 19th century, the idea that the the diagnosis, the identification of disease, no longer even requires the patient to be alive, let alone to tell their story. And it's the centrality of bodies then, bodies of patients, that is really the focus of this medical collecting. Because by demonstrating their authority over a whole range of natural and artificial objects, doctors are by extension demonstrating their ability as authoritative curators of the bodies of patients. The doctor as orderly collector is the progenitor of the doctor as the curator of bodies, the clinical doctor, the legacy of which is still with us, with us today. Thank you very much indeed.